Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Tree Equity. I'm Margaret Lagerset, Adult Services Librarian here at the Thomas Crane Public Library. As a reminder, as you join, this event is being recorded. We ask that everyone remain muted until the end when we take questions. If you do have questions during the program, please enter them in the chat so they can be answered when the hosts are ready for them. Uh, this event is also being live streamed to our YouTube channel and will be recorded for later viewing to be available on our YouTube channel. And now I'll turn it over to Carolyn. Hi folks, thanks so much for joining tonight. Um, I'm Carolyn donahue Willette, and I'm a member of the Quincy Tree Alliance and we're so excited to see such a great turnout for this talk about tree equity. So um, as many of you know, trees are really critical infrastructure, especially in the urban environment. And tonight we're gonna to talk about making sure that every neighborhood has equal access to trees, no matter who you are, where you come from, what your background is, what your economic circumstances are, um, or you know where you live. Um, so we have three fantastic speakers tonight that we're incredibly lucky to have. We have Molly Henry, Senior Manager of Climate and Health at American Forests. So she's going to discuss their work around tree equity and in particular, the tree equity score, which is an analytical tool developed by the American Forest to understand tree equity um, at the local level down to the neighborhood. Um, we also have David Mashulam, Executive Director of Speak for the Trees Boston. He's going to speak about their work. Um, they have done incredible work in Boston, you know, working for tree equity within the city and also access to to jobs around urban forestry that are, you know, they are jobs of the future and they are good jobs. And last but not least, we have Chris Hayward, our very own Quincy Tree Warden, who is going to talk about the urban forest in Quincy. You know, as you all know, we are a very diverse city. We're a rapidly growing city and changing city. And with that comes quite a few challenges. And he's going to walk us through how we can think about equity challenges on the local level. All right. And just as a quick introduction to the Quincy Tree Alliance, we are a new organization. We're about a year old now. We're a membership-based organization, fully volunteer, and our mission is to increase and protect the urban canopy in Quincy. And one of the things that we do is through education and advocacy, just like events here tonight. And so with that, I am going to pass it over to Molly to kick us off. So Molly, thank you so much. And I pass the torch to you. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for the introduction. Really great to be here with you all tonight, at least virtually. And um, thank you so much for hosting this event. I um, am really excited to talk to you all today about the tool that we have called Tree Equity Score. And I just want to let you know that for the three speakers, we all kind of talked about trying to give you all a couple minutes after each of our presentations to ask questions uh, we'll try to address things that are in the chat box or verbally and um, turn it over to the next presenter. And if there's time at the end, maybe we can do some more Q&A. But I realize that some of the tree equity score stuff, there might be some questions and you want to digest that and get that process first. And then the other two will have a little bit of a different presentation. So we figured this might be helpful to just kind of sort through those questions one by one. So with that, I am going to share my screen. I just want to thank our hosts here tonight with the Quincy Tree Alliance and um, the Thomas Crane Public Library. Super great to have these awesome hosts. And then my co-presenters here, Debbie from Speak for the Trees and um, Chris with the city of Quincy. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with American Force, but we are a national nonprofit and... Um, we are actually the oldest nonprofit, con national nonprofit conservation organization in the nation. Uh, so um, being a national organization, of course, in the nation, right? Redundant. Um, but essentially, um, actually, we're coming up on our 150 year anniversary, anniversary now. So um, pretty cool stuff. We've been at this for a long time. And we've had a lot of different missions along the way. But uh, this is kind of our current mission that we have and how it's evolved over time and really looking at bringing the trees 
um, in terms of their benefits for climate, people, water, and wildlife. And we do this through a lot of different ways, um, having innovative tools like tree equity score, place-based partnerships like we have with Speak for the Trees in Boston, um, and then really working to plant and restore forests and really build a movement. And one of the things we're trying to do is build a movement around tree equity. Um, and we're really trying to bring those economic and environmental benefits to people so that it can be fully realized in all communities, as we talked about, no matter where you live and uh, where you come from, your background, your socioeconomic status. Um, I mentioned our history a little bit. So just a, a picture here, we actually helped start the uh, U.S. Forest Service. So again, just really rich history here. And these are the four issues that drive us. And I think you know, in terms of urban forestry and in particular tree equity, all four of these issues, um, you know, can be highlighted, but I'm going to kind of focus more on the climate change and equity components. But of course, we know that trees can help with water um, and provide habitat for all sorts of wildlife. Uh, if you're not familiar with the benefits of trees, it, I mean, there's a whole host of benefits, but you've probably been underneath a tree and been like, wow, in the middle of the summer, this is so much cooler. We've actually seen research that shows that, um, I'll see if I can point the mouse here, you can see that, uh, that trees can cool a neighborhood by as much as 10 degrees. So that's a difference between a 90 degree day and an 80 degree day, right? So that has huge implications for how that impacts people's health and well-being. Um, and as the climate does change and we get those um, more warmer and extreme um, temperatures, that becomes incredibly important. Um, they also help capture carbon dioxide, um, you know, one of the greenhouse gases we're always trying to target. And um, funny enough, our urban trees actually, as it stands right now, capture about a little over 3% of, of our overall carbon um, dioxide emissions. So it might seem small, uh, but think about if we expanded it equitably, how much more we could capture. And also think about, um, you know, how important it is to have that, because not only are you having those carbon benefits, right, but it's, it's where the people live so that we can have all these other benefits. So just wanted to name a few of the benefits you probably experienced in yourself, um, but I don't want to go too deep into it. Um, our programs, so we have two different uh, programs at, with American Forests. We have our tree equity program, which exclusively uh, works in urban forestry, and our resilient forest program that works on natural uh, landscapes and forested landscapes. So tree equity is kind of something that we've really gone all in, and it's not something that is going anywhere for us. We're very dedicated to this. Um, and uh, part of the reason is that what we see is just looking at a map or even going in a neighborhood, you can already kind of, it indicates what the, you know, conditions are for the, um, the residents there in terms of their socioeconomic status, um, their race. Uh, and that's a real problem. We shouldn't be able to tell who is living in a neighborhood just by the amount of tree canopy that they have. And so that is why we created Tree Equity Score. And this is our homepage here, and I'm going to demo it in just a minute. But as I mentioned, this has some pretty big consequences. So this is just an example looking at on your left tree canopy. Um, so that meaning the, the cover that we have for our, our tree um, trees and cities and how much really um, um, cover basically it has. And then over to the right, we have temperature. This is surface temperature. So where it's darker, it's hotter. So you can kind of see an inverse relationship here. The lighter areas that have less um, on the left that have less tree canopy have darker areas that are um, hotter. And this really has some major consequences when we talk about who is actually uh, taking the brunt of this, right? So oftentimes what we see nationally, and we found this with our tree equity score analysis, is that the trend is not, not in every single case. And interestingly enough, Quincy has some... Um, some differences here, but the national trend is that we see less tree canopy is in areas where we have higher levels of poverty and more communities with people of color. So the tree equity score is really just a way to measure um, how much a neighborhood and municipality is bringing the benefits um, of trees to um, people and in particular in our low income communities and communities of color. Um, and those that are most vulnerable to a changing climate, such as our seniors and children. 
I'm not going to go too much into the methodology here because it kind of gets a little nerdy, but I just want to give you a little context around what tree equity score is. So um, we do have a methodology page and I'll put a link in after, but essentially what we're doing is we have canopy data actually for all of the urbanized areas in the United States. Um, and we are looking at where the current cover is in that municipality, taking into account population density, right? So where we have higher density and more people, there's less possibility for trees. So we use that data together to come up with a goal or a target for that neighborhood. And then we have a priority index, which you see over here to the right, that has six different characteristics that are equally weighted. And we um, look at income, employment, surface temperature, race, age, and in particular, that's seniors and children. And then health, which is a composite um, data set from the CDC. And this basically gives us a score from zero to 100. And what this means is that if you have a neighborhood that's at 100, they've reached tree equity. The lower the score, the higher the need. So if you have a neighborhood that's a 50 versus a 90, you would want to prioritize the neighborhood that has a score of 50. And so um, we actually have two different types of tools. I'm going to show you our national um, explorer today. Uh, we have a tree equity score analyzer, which is our deeper dive tool. But essentially, uh, this gets us down to the neighborhood level. Uh, it's um, able to kind of estimate what the citywide ecosystem benefits would be of raising tree equity scores in the neighborhoods that you have. And then um, you can actually generate reports on um, the municipal level and also congressional districts, and um, you can generate state reports. The tree equity score analyzer, we have one in Rhode Island where I'm based, I didn't mention that. Um, and we're looking and building actually a number of them uh, throughout the country in Boston is actually, um, I believe second or third on our list. So um, that is coming soon. So I am gonna close this out and I am gonna share my screen so I can demo this real quick. And I'm gonna put in Quincy. So this is just treeequityscore.org. And it kind of takes you right there. And just a quick demo so you can get familiar. I find personally, it's kind of easier to drive yourself and explore a tool yourself. It's harder to kind of watch somebody, but I just want to show you a few tricks and where you can find them. So already, if you look around here, it's set on tree equity score. The areas that are darker in orange represent the areas that should be prioritized, right? They have lower scores. The areas that are in green are doing pretty well. You can um, kind of pan around and start to see how these numbers stack up. And then you can look at different layers that we have that's all part of the tree equity score. So that methodology that I talked about in the beginning. So you can look at the canopy cover, you can look at the gap, which is between the existing canopy and the target goal that I talked about that takes into account population density. And then these are all the different priority indicators, right? So you can start to see how themes stack up. Really important to mention redlining here. So uh, we're, you know, back in, um, gosh, not even that long ago, right? So I think it was in the 60s that it um, really ended where Banks were not giving out loans specifically to people of color. Um, and that resulted in all sorts of issues in terms of home ownership um, and the kind of resources that went into those neighborhoods. So trees are very much a part of that story. And we actually added this redlining data um, most recently as it's becoming available. It's not available everywhere in the country, uh, but it is here in Quincy. So you all are lucky to, to have that included in the map here. So you can see that. Areas uh, with lower ratings where they weren't giving out uh, bank loans were right around here. Um, and then you can look at the, the satellite too, just to kind of get a frame of reference. And then I'll just show you the filters real quick. This is where it gets really cool if you're thinking about um, really honing in on different project areas. You want to look at the lower tree equity score areas. You can just filter out and it'll show you exactly uh, where you might want to target. You can even say, I want to go to areas that have, um, you know, higher um, 
populations of seniors and you're really looking to kind of target that population and look at, okay, where's the highest percentage of seniors and lowest tree equity score, I can get right there, right? So that would be our, our neighborhood we'd wanna work on. Here's where it gets even cooler. We can click on that uh, neighborhood or block group and over to the left, this actually shows us a number of things. So the tree equity score, where it ranks in terms of all the other block groups in the, in the uh, municipality. So this is actually um, second to last. So it's 71 out of 72. And uh, this is a radar graph. So the more uh, red that you see in this, uh, the more of a priority it is in terms of that priority index I talked about with those um, different characteristics. So uh, this one in particular has very high temperatures, pretty considerable number for people in poverty, very high on seniors because we filtered for that. Um, and then also, you know, fair amount of people of color and um, unemployment. So that makes it a pretty good priority. So then um, when we look here too, we can see the canopy cover goal was 40%, but really that is only at 13%. So that's 27% that um, is lacking there and um, or room for improvement, I should say. And finally, I'll just show you this because I want to give the other speakers enough time to talk. Um, this is where you can find the municipal report. A couple things you can find in here. Um, you can look at the general distribution of tree equity scores in terms of which how many block groups are in those different categories or ranges. And then we can look at the relationship between tree canopy and these three different characteristics, looking at people of color, people in poverty, and average temperature. This was a super interesting one to me because I look at this a lot and look at different municipalities. Uh, what this is telling me here with this graph is that we're looking at this line is our mean or our average percent canopy for the entire city, right? Just kind of taking an average. So this is telling me that neighborhoods that have 60 to 80% people of color um, actually have, um, sorry, I'm sorry, I meant to go to this one. That have 80 to 100 actually have almost 5% more than the average um, for the city, which is usually not the trend we see. We usually kind of see the, the kind of dip like um, all the way down. So that's an interesting one and definitely something to kind of explore uh, why that is the case. Um, I mean, that is also a very great thing too, um, worth celebrating. Um, and then this kind of goes in line with what we see in terms of, you know, more poverty usually means that they're more on the, um, you know, negative end of the citywide average. And then uh, you can also look at temperature. Also super interesting. Usually we see the trend just like that. For some reason, um, you have here 20 to 40 percent, um, or I should say about, geez, 20, 27 percent more than the, the average, you actually are in a lower um, per percentile for, for temperature. So just kind of interesting uh, trends here and, and worth looking into. So finally, I'll just bring you to this. This is a super cool tool. Um, this is kind of a slider ball bar that um, is uh, dynamic. And it tells you if you want to get up all of your neighborhoods up to a score of say 90, and that's a goal. And so thinking about municipalities creating goals, um, and thinking about short-term and long-term goals or policy making um, or an advocacy tool. Uh, we can say that we need 46,000 or a little bit more um, to plant uh, in order for all of the neighborhoods to, to get up to a score of 90. And that would give us all of these many benefits here. So we look at things like the ecosystem value in terms of um, the economic value, the number of jobs that could be supported. So thinking about employing people too and employing people locally. Uh, and then thinking about the ecosystem benefits here, carbon and air pollution and rain interception. Um, there's so much more that you can do with this tool. I don't wanna take up any more time, uh, but there's also a district report. So you can look at your, um, you know, just I'll just show you real quick, the district and it'll kind of give you a different. So you can actually, go and generate that and you could share it with your, um, it's up here, Congressional District 8. It'll actually show you who 
your senators, your representatives are. So great way to tie in some advocacy if you're super into this. So that is all I have for now. And I think I can take a few questions. I don't know if any came in the chat. And I'll share these links too. We don't have anything in the chat, but if anyone has a burning question or that they'd like to ask before we go to the next question, we would love, well, we would, we would welcome them. Otherwise we can hold them to the end of the. Could I ask a technical question? Sure. Um, Molly, could you just walk through again real quickly how you could, over, this easiest way to overlap for a, you know, a little district within the city, both canopy and let's say poverty, um, the easiest way to show that together? Yeah, you're looking at specifically a congressional district? No, in the city. Oh, just in the city? Yeah. Let, um, let me just share again. What you would do, you can click on any one of these. Actually, I'm going to do it a different way. You just want to look at, I'm sorry, your question again was to look at which demographic. Uh, I want you to be able to have almost as if they were like transparency. So I could say for um, low income, what's the tree canopy look like in an area or yeah. in a city? Um, you, know, you can actually. Overlapping. Yep. You can look, you could put turn on the poverty layer. And what you could do is you could look around and you can see, see as it's showing you percent poverty as you go around to each of these. But when you click on it, it gives you all the information here, including the current canopy cover. So um, that's the best way, I think, to find both of those pieces of information at the same time. Okay. I think she wanted to look at the canopy cover, which might be a satellite map. You want or to just a visual of just a visual of the, you know, the different color arrangements that yep. you have. If we could do, t if it does two. Yeah, you can't do the layers. You can't do, do two once. layers at the same time. But what you could actually do is depending on what you're looking at, if you want to look at um, the tree canopy cover and then you want to look at um, look the neighborhoods that have the highest, you know, um, poverty rates, you could do it that way, but it's not quite getting at what you're looking to visualize it at the same time. I don't think there's the ability to really. Okay. Yeah. This is great. Thank yeah. you again. Okay. This is so brilliant. It's a, it's Thank a you. great question though. Yeah. And we do have, we do have one good question in the chat and that is um, very relevant to Quincy. How are marsh areas accounted for? Um, Quincy in particular has quite a few marshes and I think many of them are recently restored within the last few decades. So younger marshes especially. Is there any way to account for that in the tool or not, not quite yet? Yeah. Usually they look at plantable area and I'm not going to say, you know, it's not exactly perfect. And um, I'm not here representing our data science and GIS team who is like deeply involved in SUW because <laughs> they're like, they can answer all of these questions immediately, but I'm happy to follow up on that. What I do know is that different land uses like airports, um, and other areas that we know are not plantable are usually taken out of it. Sometimes where we have large parks, we take that out too if people don't live there. The key here is that in order to get a tree equity score, there has to be people that are living in that block group. So um, if you do have a very expansive marsh and there's no population in that particular block group, you're not going to get a tree equity score. But I'm happy to um, follow up with my uh, data science team and GIS team to see kind of how they account for wetlands. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is so interesting. Now I have I do analytics in my in my day job, so I'm very curious now. <laughs> All right. So with that, do we want, David, are you ready? Um, thank you, Molly. Good to see you. Um, oh, someone just asked you a question. Uh, it's all right. I can sorry. type it in the, the box. Okay, yeah. fine. Good. Hi, uh, my name is David Meshulam. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. And uh, I actually had a, an opportunity, I'd say Maggie was it about a year ago to learn about the work you all were doing. Um, and you guys have come a long way in Quincy in, in thinking about this and working around with, a, with a, I might say, a wonderful tree warden, uh, Chris, uh, who I've known for quite a while. 
Um, and I'm here to talk about an organization that I founded uh, about four years ago called Speak for the Trees Boston. We partner very closely with American Forests and Arbor Day and, and other organizations, including the US Forest Service, Mass DCR. Uh, let me give you an overview of what we do. Um, and let's see, let me share my screen. Here's a, a, a shot of our website. Uh, and, and this is a teen group that we worked with last summer in our Teen Urban Tree Corps program. Uh, they, on their very last day, got to climb this beautiful red oak uh, in, uh, in Boston. And with these wonderful uh, tree climbers, the, the uh, Baron and uh, Melissa Lavangi, who run this women's cl tree climbing workshop. Uh, so I invite you, whenever you have a chance, to hop to our website, learn about our work at treeboston.org. But I want to give you a little bit of history of my work um, and what brought me here. Uh, so uh, my work goes back to 2018 when I was uh, still teaching high school uh, in the Boston area. I was actually teaching in Newton. And I decided I wanted to work with teens outdoors. So I developed this uh, program called Teens for Trees with a small nonprofit that still exists today. So they've been around since 1983 uh, called Trees for Watertown. And uh, we, I think, did two or three summers together. And I had the good fortune of working at the time with a young man um, who was tree warden at the time. I don't know if you'll recognize him. This guy here, uh, Chris Hayward, uh, who was our tree warden uh, back in the day in Watertown. And, and uh, Chris was so helpful and instrumental in getting the program going, in supporting our work, in celebrating trees. And it really was such a pleasure, Chris, to work with you. And you've taught me so much. You guys are really lucky in Quincy to have such a professional tree warden. Um, he cares deeply about the work. Uh, he, he knows the laws in and out and, um, and trees are complicated objects. Uh, so, uh, Chris taught me a lot and, and there's a lot, I'm sure that you all at, at Quincy Tree Alliance are learning too fr from him. I just want to acknowledge, uh, the amazing support that Chris has given me over the years. And out of that work, uh, I've been, um, engaged a lot, uh, in expanding out of Watertown into Boston and to bring tree equity Hopefully one day uh, that our work will expand beyond the city of Boston, but right now we're focused just on Boston. And the center of our work is a commitment to not only equity, but diversity, justice, and inclusion. And we do that in a lot of different uh, ways. We do that by celebrating trees. We do that by planting and giving away trees that help grow and sustain Boston's urban forest. We uh, connect residents to neighborhoods and neighbors. And we are aiming to train the next generation of tree wardens, folks like Chris Hayward. Um, so before uh, Molly and their team made uh, their tree equity map, uh, we were talking about tree equity in Boston and um, their GIS team were busy creating uh, a national map. And we were lucky enough to partner with a grad student over at Boston University to really dig in to what uh, tree equity looks like in our city of Boston. I'm going to walk you through our map a little bit and what it's meant for us and, and how we're using it. It's very similar to Molly's map, but has um, some differences that, and I invite you to play with it as well. Um, it does not include Quincy, unlike, unlike the American forest map. So uh, real quick, uh, this, the grad student we work with uh, was over at the BU uh, School of Environment and Geography. Uh, and she was on a fellowship through their program that required her to work on a, um, on a project with a nonprofit. And we were, we were facing an issue. Uh, we really were struggling to find places where we could plant trees. And I turned to Raquel and I said, Raquel, can you help us figure out where to plant trees? And she got so excited about our work. She said, I'll do even more than that. I'll help you not only understand where to plant trees, but I'll help you understand where the, the need is greatest. Um, so in a city like Boston, as you might imagine, uh, it's a very diverse community in so many ways, not only in its people, but also its geography. So what uh, Raquel was able to do is she, she took some publicly accessible data, things like temperature uh, and things like um, air pollution. Uh, she took data on demographics, 
And then she also took data on vegetation. And these were all data sets that were publicly available. And then she finally took this parcel level data. So data on every single parcel in Boston. There are tens of thousands of parcels. Some are privately owned, some are publicly owned. Um, and she created our map. Um, and I wanna just, I'm gonna hop off my screen share for a minute and, and jump into the actual map to show you how, wh what you're able to do with it. So if you go to our website here, go to tree equity, you can click on these maps here. And she's created what's called a story map. And when you land on this story map here, you'll see on the left, there are sort of five different chapters. The first chapter is about tree canopy coverage in, in Boston. Uh, and this is broken up by census block. And every census block uh, has a different color, right? And you can click on it and you get the tree canopy coverage for that census group. Uh, the darker colors are, of course, more tree canopy coverage. So let me notice here's Franklin Park, right? Tree canopy coverage of 68%. Immediately, some patterns start to emerge. Uh, you can also look at, like I said, uh, average air temperature. So, you know, 83 degrees uh, here in the park is 74 degrees. Uh, and similarly, we have the air pollution map. And you can look at that by by census block. And finally, we have Boston's people. So here we have racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, there's this band in Boston that goes from Roxbury into Dorchester and Mattapan, and also East Boston, primarily uh, minorities. Things like language isolation, income map, so where poverty levels are, um, and percentage of people 65 years or older. We thought that would be interesting as we're thinking about tree canopy coverage. And finally, population density. Many of these demographic factors are defined by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, language, minority, income, as environmental justice communities. And, and that's part of Ma Massachusetts law, actually, um, that provides uh, extra protections and services for environmental justice communities. And finally, uh, we came up with this tool that allows you to to examine tree canopy coverage against any of these factors. So for example, household income and tree canopy coverage. Uh, this takes a little while to load because there's a lot of data here. Uh, but as it loads, you will see that what Raquel has allowed us to do is use this magnifying glass to sort of get a more visual sense of where is, what did I say? Income, income versus tree canopy coverage. Um, and we were working to really understand this also more quantitatively. And finally, the real amazing piece of data here, and this is more like what Molly was mentioning with the tree equity score analyzer, is where can we find opportunities to plant, um, to plant trees? Boston's a very, very dense city. So we wanted to find those parcels where we might be able to plant trees. So what Raquel did is she, using only satellite imagery, uh, analyzed every single parcel in the city of Boston. And we can find a parcel like this, right? And it's not, hold on, it's not populating the, usually there's a, there's a box that pops up. Just give me one sec here. Oh, there, it's hidden behind you all, that's why. Uh, so there's a box that pops up that gives us all the information we need to know about that parcel. Gives us the address, gives us the owner, gives us an approximation of how, many, of how much available planting space we think there is and how many trees might fit in that planting space. So we can now layer in all the information we need, right? Here's a big plot. This is probably owned by, oh, this is an apartment building, right? A lot of space here to plant trees. We can now work with residents of this apartment complex to figure out, do you wanna plant trees with us, right? It's a way for us to target um, our work. We just today, and Molly, this is news to you maybe, we just today hired a, um, a, a community tree planting specialist who's gonna help us dig through these data and figure out where we're gonna target our tree planting work in the future. So that's a tool that we have. Um, 
And I'll just uh, quickly go through the rest of our work. And I invite folks to, you know, post questions in the chat window. Um, and once I'm done, we, uh, I'm happy to go through that map a little more with you all. Um, so this is what I was just describing. You can find specific parcels and figure out how many trees might go there. Um, and then what we do is we actually do events, right? Here's an example of an event at Boys and Girls Club in the fall where we planted five trees in front of their building. Uh, and we also do events where we target communities and we give residents free trees that they can plant in their yard. We teach them at the event how to plant the tree, they take it home, we follow up with them and uh, to ensure that they're taking care of their tree. Uh, do I have time to share a little bit of, I don't know what time it is right now. I wanna leave enough time for questions. Share a quick video. I want to share with you a little bit about our teen program that overlays this idea of equity in, in the urban forest with equity in the workforce. Um, and it's a really critical component. If we're going to build a sustainable urban forest that has to be centered not only on the trees, but also on the people who live in those neighborhoods who can care for those trees and advocate for, for those trees. So Chris, pay attention. There's probably stuff here from 2018 that you'll remember. Um, that looks very similar. This is this is um, this is our Teen Urban Tree Corps program in Boston. I had no idea about the redlining, how poor neighborhoods didn't have enough trees due to like racism. Because I was like, I knew racism happened, but it was like trees. Are you serious? We're in a crisis point in our environmental efforts, and we're seeing that with hotter summers and more inequitable distribution of sort of the health benefits of trees. Speak for the Trees is an urban and community forestry nonprofit, and we focus on changing how people think about and relate to trees in Boston. It's really important to take care of our uh, climate and just learn how to protect the environment and all the plants and trees in nature. Our Teen Urban Tree Corps program is a six-week summer program where we get about 15 youth to learn about and experience how we care for our urban forests in Boston. We've had speakers come in and just talk about their profession, what they do, and also we've been walking around the Fields Corner neighborhood. We've been looking at trees, we've been inventorying them, we've just been doing a lot of different things related to trees around the area. I think they're at this point where they really understand the inequities of our system uh, and feel empowered to do things and want to do things and we're giving them voice and opportunity to do that. This job actually forces me to go outside. When I'm walking, oh my God, this is a maple tree. This is a healthy tree. Or like, oh my God, this tree doesn't have enough space. We're gonna serve Boston for decades to come by planting more trees, by getting people to care about trees and really increasing awareness about why trees matter. All right, so you'll notice that last slide there, I um, included the partners we have, and I just encourage folks in Quincy to um, find some partnerships. And a couple I, I think probably you know about, and I know Chris knows about, is the DCR. They have an urban and community forestry program led by Julie Coop. Fantastic program. They have trainings, education, resources. They even have a matching grant program. Uh, the Stockbridge School of Agriculture has one of the best forestry programs in the in the country, um, and I encourage folks to reach out to fo to learn more about that program. The U.S. Forest Service is fantastic. There's free online tools like iTree. I could go on and on, and of course, American Forests um, too, and then also Arbor Day. So Molly, you reminded me, uh, you guys are 150 years old. Um, Arbor Day is celebrating 50 years. The Arbor Day Foundation is celebrating 50 years this year. But the first Arbor Day, which is the last Friday of April, um, the first Arbor Day is also 150 years old, or will be 150 this, this, uh, this April. So there's something about trees. I mean, they've been with us for a long time, um, but I think there's also like 
in a way, the work we're doing still feels new. So with that, um, I'm happy to take take ton, as many questions as folks have, and, and then I'll turn it over to Chris. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so Susan asks that she, or she says she saw Mayor Wu on television recently talking about trees as a priority of the administration and wants to know how you work with the city government. Um, I would love to see that clip. I, I've worked with Mayor Wu in the past, well, while she was counselor. She's a little, a little harder to get a hold of these days. I know it's a, she's really committed to this. Um, I will say this, um, and, and Chris, you can sort of probably give this more nuance. Um, it's really challenging to plant and care for trees. It's expensive, it's labor intensive. Uh, there's a, it's in an urban area, you're dealing with a lot of competing uh, priorities and in infrastructure, things like wires, gas leaks, um, public safety. Um, so what seems like a, an easy lift, let's just go plant more trees. When you start to unpack it, it's, it's complicated and expensive. Um, so I think Mayor Wu is committed to that, but I think she's also realizing that it's going to take a long time to hire enough staff to get the, the, the software infrastructure in place, to get enough watering trucks out there, right? All that stuff that goes into ensuring that you're not just planting trees, but you're ensuring that they're going to be cared for. Um, so I think the reality is, is like, I'm yeah. totally on board with the Wu train with her commitment to tree equity but it's going to take a long time to build it. Um, yeah, she was catching it a lot in terms of um, environmental, um, you know, trees impact on the environment and on the air quality yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. I would love to see that video. I, uh, I, um, I, I think it was channel five, probably. That's what I usually watch, but I don't remember for sure. So, yeah. And the problem we face in Boston is uh, in order to hire an arborist, uh, they're unionized, uh, they're required to live in the city. So now, you know, even if the city tomorrow wanted to hire 12 new arborists to join the crew, uh, it would be really hard. Not only is there a shortage of arborists, but it's, it's ex the pay the arborists get, the tree climbers get, isn't adequate necessarily for them to afford living in Boston. Mm -hmm. We do have two similar questions, which I think yeah. maybe they're good questions for all three of you, actually, um, in regards to working with planning and development and developers um, for new for new developments. And then another layer on that, which a few people have asked about, is um, encouraging native species in particular. I just wanted to put in a plug for the urban forest plan that the city is working on. So um, that's going to be released, I believe, this spring. And that's looking at kind of how they're currently managing the urban forest, what the community really wants to see for the um, urban forest. And in particular, actually, American Forest is part of the team that's working on the urban forest plan. And we're looking specifically at opportunities for workforce development in, in urban forestry and, and how that can play a role in helping kind of meet the growing demand that is the planting and maintenance of trees. And I believe the um, comment about the Boston Planning and Development um, protocol for, for tree plantings for new developments has come up quite a bit in a lot of the community meetings. I know Dev David is sitting on the community advisory board. Um, I think it's something like 40 plus members on that, um, that, you know, have really, that's been a very heated discussion. And I know the uh, work that you lead, David, with the Boston Urban Forest Friends, it comes up time and time again. So I don't know if you have any insights on where that is, because you're more connected with it on the, the CAB or Community Advisory Board side of things. So if it's specific to the Boston Planning and Development Authority, um, it's an interesting time to be engaging with them because Michelle Wu has promised to disband them. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to think like what, uh, what are, what's going to be their role in the future of Boston. Um, and I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but they're sort of one of the only private public quasi public agencies left in the city and they have a lot of authority. I, I, I'm not really sure exactly like, how that's going to play out, not only in terms of trees and tree equity, but in terms of like the larger conversation around proper development in Boston. So um, 
certainly we do some advocacy work. I didn't mention that in, in the talk, but we were really instrumental in some of the work in Roxbury um, last year for Melnia Cass, the saving of over 200 mature trees in Lower Roxbury and Melnia Cass Boulevard. We continue to engage with residents in Hyde Park and some other advocacy work in Dorchester and Charlestown. So it's been, there's certainly a lot of work to do in terms of changing how people think about and respect trees. Um, I do want to touch on that native tree question, and, and Chris, I'd be curious to hear how you're thinking about it. And I'll just, I'll just say um, it's a slippery question because in one sense, we love native trees and we recognize that they're really, really important for supporting native habitat and wildlife and all that. Um, at the same time, especially in an urban area, we recognize that not all trees are created equal and that some trees are just a lot more resilient in an urban environment than others. And, um, and that sort of limits the palette of trees you can, you can select from, right? Because if you plant a tree that's not gonna do well in salt or compact soil, um, asphalt, then why plant it? So you wanna make sure that you plant a tree that's gonna survive. And you also wanna make sure that you plant a diversity of trees. So if you get an insect that comes along like the emerald ash borer, or you get the Dutch elm disease, you have enough variety in your stock that you're not going to wipe out 50% of your trees with one insect. So those things are sort of intention. And then I'm going to complicate it a little more in that with climate change, our, our tree species are migrating north, right? So we're going to have a climate that's more like Washington, D.C. or the Carolinas in 20 years and I'm not sure that the trees that are native to Quincy or to Boston are going to do well in 20 years. So we have to be thinking ahead. If we're only planting natives, what does native even mean <laughs> in a changing climate? So there's, it's, it's nuanced. And um, while I do promote and, and think natives are important, I think we need to be mindful that it's not, it, it, it's not an all or nothing type of thing. Well said. Nice job. I, I, I learned from the best. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And with that, Chris, I think we will pass it off to you, our, our very own tree warden, king of the uh, forest. All right. Well, hey, thank you very much for, uh, you know, inviting me to come out and speak. I learned an awful lot just from listening to Molly and Dave, David. So thanks a lot. Um, some of you folks may know me, some of you may not, but um this whole pandemic kind of ruined my uh, idea of getting out into the community and meeting everybody. So this is how I've met like most of Quincy through like my computer screen at night, which is not really cool, but I'm thankful for that anyway. Um, one of the things that I was tasked with um, when I first started was being the first tree warden that we think we know of that ever wore this hat in the city of Quincy. Um, we don't really know what we have. We, we kind of have an idea what we have for our urban forest, but really, what is it? How many is it? What's the diversity? What are we looking at? And so my boss and uh, Mayor Koch said, well, we really need you to put together an inventory. We want you to go around and start counting trees. And while you're at counting them and identifying them and analyzing them, working with the residents that have maybe some concerns about, you know, this one's hitting my house or this tree's been had had a crack in it for 50 years and nobody's done anything about it. So I'm doing a bunch of different things, but the inventory is a tool that when you go back and you think about tree equity, how important that is. Now, you saw recently here some maps and some shades and some colors, but what do we have on the ground? When you're walking around in the city, what do we actually have? So that's what I'm all about here. And, and why is an inventory so important? So I just wrote down a couple of things while I was sitting here waiting for this uh, the meeting to start, but the importance of um, an inventory for first and foremost, for a big city, it's reduced liability. If somebody had called 10 years ago and said the tree in front of my house is in really tough shape and that note got passed down to this person, to that person, to that person, and then it got stuck between the seats of some guy's truck and then the tree falls over, City's actually liable. We were notified. We should have done something about it. And unfortunately, that probably, it was being done for the longest time, but with not from like a management kind of perspective, it was more from the, okay, somebody just called, let's go out there and look at that tree. Well, there's probably like 90 other trees that are just like that note that nobody's called in yet. Nobody's paying attention. Not everyone has time. 
to go out and look at the tree in front of their home. So they bring in a tree warden. And now my job is to kind of manage and maintain and put guys in the right places and prioritize the right way. So reduce liability is huge. Um, I hear people all the time saying it costs so much to live in the city. And well, it costs a lot more if we were paying all kinds of insurance claims out to people about projects and problems that we knew about and we didn't do anything about. <clears throat> um, on that note, improve tree health. So if we know what we have and we know the liabilities we have, we can take care of those. Um, a little bit of heavy science here, and I'll just go quickly, but certain trees release certain types of pheromones, different types of smells and different types of things when they're starting to suffer, when they're starting to fail, which attracts different types of bugs to come in. And those bugs could set up shop and actually start to affect some of our healthy trees. So it's a way to kind of clean up our invertebrate forest, go around, take care of all the bad stuff the best we can. Pruning and uh, maintaining are the things we want to do the most. Unfortunately, we have to do a lot of removals. It is an urban forest. So um, there are a lot of conflicts like David had mentioned earlier. So the other thing about uh, the inventory is knowing your landscape. Again, what do we have on the ground? We're walking around out there. We're looking around, but what do we have? We don't know. One whole neighborhood's maybe all red oaks. The next whole neighborhood is all ash. You know what's going to happen when that emerald ash borer comes in? That neighborhood with all the ash we're going to end up losing that. So we want to start to know what's on the ground, know where we have to prioritize for our planting. We plant about 500 tree trees a year. And with the help of the DCR that David also mentioned there, uh, we're planting almost about a thousand trees a year in, in Quincy. The DCR trees are uh, only in specific neighborhoods based on um, income levels. And they're also, uh, they can plant in front yards, backyards, side yards, where our program is mostly uh, along the streets, parks, <clears throat> public land. Um, so knowing what kind of trees, where we want them, budgeting is a big thing about our inventory. So now we're going to, we know we're going to be probably having to take down a bunch of trees here because they're in tough shape. They've been infested. They've been, the roots have been beat up over the years. Now we need to know, what, are we going to put all of our budgeting into that one street or that one neighborhood, or do we have enough we can split it around? Because we don't want to just bring trees to just one neighborhood. We want to give out as many to as many people as we possibly can. So we need to budget that. It's going to cost a contractor a little bit more to go around a big city that can be sometimes tough to get around. Um, having an inventory means it's an inventory is in, in this particular case, it's a living and growing, breathing thing. It, it the, the, the urban forest. So you really need to know what's going on with it seasonally anyway. I, I can't say daily. None of us could ever do that daily. But seasonally, we really need to know what's going on with our, our urban forest. So by monitoring, you, and the only reason you can get, the only way you can get an inventory done is you have to be out there in the field. you got to be taking a look around at what kind of trees we have and what's the condition. How did that October nor'easter affect uh, some of our bigger, more mature tree trees? And do we have a lot of split branches, a lot of hanging branches? Um, are there trees that are uprooted? We're going to have to take a look at these to get them out and replant as soon as we can stumps that are around that we maybe have forgotten about. When I came on board, I found some stumps that I looked up old requests and these stumps have been in the ground for like 10 years. Just, we just kind of, it's a big city. We have about, we're thinking about 25,000 trees and someday we hopefully will know for certain. So I have to imagine, you know, over the years, maybe a couple hundred stumps get forgotten. So <clears throat> um, monitoring, <clears throat> excuse me, keeping that inventory up is very important. And then, uh, as David just mentioned about our climate changing, the, the history. So you can look back at an inventory. It's still a document that you can look back at and say, you know, wow, this, th we used to have American oaks up and uh, American elms up and down the street. What happened? Well, like most communities, and this is just a simple kind of reference, most communities, we lost all of our American elms due to Dutch elm disease. Well, and the next thing is going to go, is going to be the ash trees, unfortunately. Emerald ash borer is a quick little moving bug. And it's probably going to take care of most of our ash trees. So <clears throat> the history says that maybe we won't, don't want to start planting ash trees right now. Let's wait for that pest to come through, do what it has to do. We maintain as best we can and we start planting something else. Maybe a, another species that's a little more similar. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm very much on board with what uh, David had to say about um, native species and I, I, I like to keep an open mind as much as possible. An urban environment is very difficult to get anything to grow in. Most of the trees that we see around here, Norway maples, uh, honey locust, um, London plain, sycamores, 
they're all, they can do very well in compacted soils. Very, they're very good with uh, uh, anaerobic conditions. They're very good and such like that. But we have other locations in the city that maybe we can prep. Maybe we can make a little bit better for some different trees that maybe aren't as local to New England. Uh, maybe they're a little bit more in the, the mid-Atlantic state. So look at our history. Look to see what's been failing. Look to see what's been doing great. Continue that a little bit. But diversity is key. Now, when you look at some of those, let me just um, let me just share my screen. I just want to show quickly. This is the uh, the tool that everybody's been asking me. Hey, but what about this inventory? Where is this inventory? So I just want to show you a little bit about what I have so far for this inventory. So this is our tree inventory as it currently sits. Uh, right now, it's a bunch of uh, nothing to all of you. So let me zoom in a little bit here. So this is just an overview of the city. And some years ago, the city paid for a flyover. <clears throat> and it picked up a whole bunch of different things, whatever the planning department was looking for, the, the zoning department was looking for, whoever uh, looked up that, uh, whoever uh, authorized the, the flyover, at DPW could have done it for certain utilities. But all these red dots here, the, the aerial flyover picked those up as trees as of, at a certain height. Now, what my business is to do is to go through and make all those red dots green. And green means that I've been there. It means that I've been out and I've inventoried that tree, or it means it's a new tree that was recently planted. There are all kinds of different figures and dashes here. Some of these trees are on private property. Some of them are out in marshes. Some of them, in, and those, I won't be picking up those anytime soon. I'm mostly doing the streets right now. Um, where you see other little letters and such, green S's mean that was a tree that recently came down. The stump still remains. Blue S's are, there's a stump there that's been there for quite a while. We've got to get at it. All the orange little dots, that's all the fine citizens of Quincy still waiting for me to come out and uh, let them know what's going on. They've been calling in. I have about 450 requests out there right now to come out and um, inspect these trees and create a work order for the crew that works for me. I have a crew of, uh, I'd say on any given day, it's probably about four and a half guys you know, the old half thing there. Um, and this is what that looks like. Now I get a work order system here and I've got people that work for me and they'll go out and they'll do different projects. And I'll kind of zoom in here a little bit where you see yellow squares. That's where I have say like a pruning here in 29 Massachusetts, I have tree pruning. And I take a picture of the tree and I give my guys what I need them to do. Just, this is just a small elm tree. I just need them to raise that over the sidewalk. So there's a, there's a work order out there for my guys to take care of. When you look at the red squares, this is a tree that's obviously in very tough shape and I need my guys to get rid of it uh, before it falls any further than that and smashes up uh, my city truck. So um, I try to keep up on top of this daily. This is, um, I start my day in the office. I go out, I'm out in the, the community almost daily. Uh, except for days like today where my iPad dies because it's too cold. But, um, and I'm dealing with residents and I'm trying to um, keep this inventory work order system as alive and as uh, uh, current as possible. Uh, when we go out and we plant trees around town, we're looking for you know, the most suitable conditions. Let me just go back to um, this other last screen here. One second, I got rid of this tool there. Let me go back to that. When you look at where all these red dots have been picked up, and it's going to take probably a little while to load, unfortunately. The red dots don't necessarily want to come up. But when you start to look a little bit at our city, the aerial photo. Yeah, the red dots probably not going to come up too much because there's so many. When you look at the areas that we don't have, when we're talking about tree equity, the areas mostly are, say, like Squantum, Howes Neck, Germantown, the downtown area. Those are the areas pretty much that we're, you know, when you, you talk about tree equity, well, why don't we have trees there? I can tell you this, that uh, last summer, I got to know some of the people in Squantum. I tried planting a tree in front of someone's house with a million dollar view of the ocean. Uh, that tree didn't get planted. <laughs> people don't want to plant trees where they have a million dollar view of the ocean. Now, from a, an environmental perspective and a tree warden perspective, arborist perspective, conservation agent perspective, those are the areas we really want to be planting trees too because of climate change. Uh, we, we really need that, that uh, land area to be secure. We need, instead of stone walls and brick walls and sea walls, trees can be very helpful. But 
I recognize that people live in those areas for the beauty that is our, our ocean front. So uh, when you get down to the city area, we try to do the best we can. The problem we've got here is the infrastructure that's currently there. Um, there's so many conflicts. There's so many things underground. There's so many things above ground. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about just quickly, I know we got to get rolling here. Um, myself, our uh, Commissioner of Natural Resources, Dave Murphy and Mayor Koch are very interested in a program called the Back of Sidewalk Tree, Locant, uh, tree Planting Program. So for instance, this is Robertson Ave. Robertson Ave is over on West Quincy. It goes from Adams Street out to Willard Street. And this is just Google, Google Maps. You can take a look at this. But if you look at this street, how tight it is, and it's a very busy cut through to get between those two major uh, roads. Look how tight this street, uh, street is. If we were to plant trees in the sidewalks, they're not going to have the best life. But if you look in this particular part of town, there are some neighbors that have some nice front yards. And if we talk with these folks, and maybe they might be interested, and in, we could spend some municipal money to plant a tree and work with the resident, not just force any type of tree, but get a little bit more diverse, something that's going to be suitable for a front yard planting. I, and, and if someone's house, if this is someone's house that's on board, I'm just, just taking a look. I'm not <laughs> picking out, nothing's been picked or chosen yet. But you see all these little places right here that we, we could potentially get a tree in. And then think about the difference that this street would look like if you went up and down with a tree in every front yard. Just for instance, right here, this neighbor right here just planted a little weeping cherry. If we had a weeping cherry in everybody's front yard, not that that's diverse enough, but it would be such a nice addition and it would be providing benefits to the city. Um, this is something that we, we'd like to look into and see if we can roll out for uh, in the fall. Basically, the program would be, and I had this program when I was tree warden in Watertown for 13 years. Um, the way we did this and the way we made it work was we put a small fee back onto the tree. Whatever it was, it didn't matter. 25 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever it took. But when you pay that in, First of all, now you get the feeling of ownership. You will own the tree after the first year. It'll be yours. Then you actually take care of something a little bit more. I remember the first time, the first year I went to college, I took a calculus class and I failed it. I went and asked my money back. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> so if we give you this tree, it just needs a little bit of water. You, you, you just a little bit and you get out and you're looking around your neighborhood but you own it and you know it and you love it. And it's something that uh, you brought along and, and it helps the city and it helps. It just really helps everybody. It's just a good thing. So when we're talking about tree equity from a tree warden's perspective, it might not be exactly what you saw on some of those maps. It might be as simple as, Hey, you got a nice front yard. Can we uh, get a nice tree there? Um, that would be very helpful for your, for your community. I could talk uh, all night long about trees and let me get out of this and stop sharing here. Let me, cancel that I, I, I'll, wit I'll be a witness to that you have talked all night long i have haven't i have how well, long have i been on there <laughs> no, no 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 i mean we 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 had the pleasure of hosting chris uh in watertown in our backyard and he loves trees i i'm i'm a i'm kind of crazy geeky passionate about it yeah <laughs> yeah all right i gotta get out of this uh thing here so let's see how do i sh stop sharing so uh I'm here for any questions uh, or chats or emails. Most of you folks know how to get me and I'm here every day. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That was great. It really, really speaks to how difficult it is to, you know, you can identify the problem and then implementation does, is not a, it's not a one summer job. No, not at all. You know, years and decades. All right. So are there, I, didn't note, see any questions in the chat unless Maggie, unless I have missed some. I got a quick question, if I may. Oh, go go Hello, for it, Anne. Chris. Um, is this an okay time to mention the idea of with the QTA and other groups, citizens inventory work that we could launch? It's a little preliminary, but I thought maybe people could get a, a little taste. I quickly say that uh, as I've been meeting with members of QTA, uh, our goal is to, it's going to, it's, it's quite the job security role right now to be counting 25,000 trees and work on work orders at the same time. So to really beef up this inventory and make it a tool that we could put back online that people could actually see what is in front of my house, what's the kind of tree in front of my neighbor's house. I'm really going to need some uh, manpower 
Um, so we're thinking about putting together a volunteer program. The problem I have right now is it's a, it's a software, it's a GIS situation. We don't want to do this on paper. Paper gets lost. It gets distorted. It gets rained on. It, it's, it's, it can become a big waste of time. We have so many tools out there in, in the modern world that we could do this like many other communities have had. It just we just have to find out how we can get this GIS working, and um, so as soon as that can be resolved, then I'll definitely be putting this out there. It's a little bit bigger of a problem than just saying, "Yeah, we'll see you on Saturday, and we'll get out there and count some trees." It's it's a little bit more than that. Yes, and em Emily T had a question about frost heave on the sidewalks and, and trees um, and also commented that newly planted trees do take quite a bit of water, as I know, with a little tiny baby red oak in my yard. <laughs> um, but it is a great idea to get a small payment to engender ownership of the trees. Right. Uh, frost heave. So uh, unfortunately, in, in most urban environments, when we plant our trees on the sidewalk, those roots are going to be looking for one thing, well, nutrients and water. And they're not getting it on the sidewalk. They're not getting it under the street. They're getting it in the neighboring front yards or any kind of open little area. So they're gonna, those roots are going to migrate under the sidewalk. In our environment, we're getting water going through the cracks in the sidewalk. So the sidewalk, there's a bump of roots underneath and we kick the sidewalk up. And especially where we're putting back a lot of concrete sidewalks, we can't replace the concrete that's been broken with new concrete because we'd have to cut the root out. What we can do is we could strategically cut some of the roots out and then layer it with some asphalt, which has a flexibility to it. A lot of people don't like the look of that. They call it a black eye. And I, and I say, you know, I'd rather have a tree in front of my house than have, you know, a nice sidewalk and a hot summer sun blast in my house. So I'm trying to, it, this is going to be mostly about education. And again, with no tree warden in this city for the longest time, uh, you know, whatever tree, whatever kind of tree stuff was being talked about, it was probably just like, hey, you know, there's a storm coming, you want to cut down my tree. And it wasn't about how important we, it is to maintain and try to do the best we can for the, the area surrounding the tree so it does the best it can for us. So um, this isn't anything about tree hugging or anything. It's all about just hard science and trying to be smart with what we're trying to accomplish here. I, I, I ask people to, as best as you can, uh, put up with the cracks in the sidewalk a little bit longer. Hopefully there'll be some kind of technology that'll come around. There, there are new things that are being tried all the time, rubber sidewalks, structural soil underneath the sidewalks. A lot of these things right now are kind of in, in their infancy stage, so they're kind of pricey. Uh, we wouldn't be getting the new roads we'd be getting if we were putting in structural soil under every, under every street tree. So uh, we kind of have to weigh the balances and it's not always easy, but I'd say just if you're off for a walk at night, maybe a little headlamp. I know that sounds horrible. <laughs> take a look around, take a look around and just please be careful out there. We, we need our big mature trees. And those are the ones that unfortunately are causing the problems and we're doing the best we can. I think Anna Lee wants to say something. You're, you're, you're muted, Anna Lee. Oh, okay. there you go. Yeah, <clears throat> I live in an older neighborhood and um, there's lots of older homes which are going to be uh, torn down and apartments replacing them. Uh, single family home becomes a uh, multi unit. And many of these older homes have uh, lots of old trees and they have to be cut down due to the construction. And Quincy is going through uh, tremendous growing right now. <clears throat> and so I know you spoke on this issue before, Chris, uh, that it is they're supposed to replace the trees that are being cut down for the new development. And uh, it's kind of hard to uh, enforce this law. Uh, there's actually a state law, as you stated, that, that they should be replaced. But that's the dilemma when uh, all the residential neighborhoods are being redeveloped because they had uh, lots of old trees. I know my son lives on Granny Street and he has huge oak tree and um, it's a beautiful tree. He spent a thousand, couple thousand dollars to have it arborist to trim it. So it, it is there and it's shades and it's beautiful. I have an old uh, sugar maple in my yard and it's definitely has at least 10 degrees cooler when I come in my yard 
from the street. So it's like such a solace to be in my yard. But when my house is being sold, it has lots of land in it. It's going to be a big multi-unit <clears throat> development on this land. I know that because that's what happens. So could you address that a little bit on this development issue? Yeah, please? absolutely. So uh, back in the Thank 90s, uh, uh, the city council put together a private tree ordinance. Um, so any tree over eight inches that's on your private property, if you're going to be developing, redeveloping, expanding your property, it starts with the building permit that you go for. The, the applicant is made aware that there's a private tree ordinance and they must contact me. So uh, there's a program there that I, do, I work with the building department pretty much weekly. And um, I meet with a lot of private landowners, private developers to talk with them about we, we look, I, what I need is a tree mitigation plan. So basically a survey that's going to show me the bigger trees that you want to take down, anything over eight inches and not if it's dying, not if it's in poor health, that, that's just a free to go. Uh, it, these trees that are in good shape, they must be mitigated for either with new planting on site. So if you, if you, um, we plant at two and a half inches per caliper or two and a half inches diameter breast height, depending on how you're looking at it. If you're going to take down a 10 inch tree, you need to replace with five trees for the, the for your property. So, and if you can't, and cause we don't, one of the things we don't want to be doing is forcing and stuffing a tree in the wrong place just because. So then you, what we do is we, um, we ask the applicant to pay into a fund so that we can plant more trees within the neighborhood uh, based on the amount of trees that you're still needing. So it's a program that um, I've had a lot of people uh, working with me. There's a couple of um, developments happening over on Adam Street that the, uh, the developer is working with me very nicely on. Uh, there's a couple up around Granite Street that are um, all these developers been calling me and everybody understands the reason why. And, and the biggest thing for me is that when some of these redevelopments go in there, there's not enough space to plant the trees. So we, you know, I'm just a tree guy. I can't say to the city, you know, you can't have a building. You have, you have a thousand square foot lot. You can't have a 900 square foot building. You know I mean? What are we going to do? I, I always say that if we could, put that into development plans. Can we put some more trees back? Can we find a little landscaped area? That, that's more important. Um, so that's what we're doing. Uh, I think right now it's, it's a, an ordinance that works well, but it definitely needs somebody in this seat because I don't think anybody else was ever doing anything with it. I think it's a burden for the planning board or the zoning board to do uh, tree warden should really be involved. I think we have two last questions. Um, for you, for you, Chris, um, the first being uh, the back of the sidewalk tre trees, do they break up sidewalks as much as a, um, a typical city street tree? Um, and then the second question is regarding using evergreen trees, um, using evergreen trees to weave electric wires instead of the trees we currently, currently use that often damage the telephone wires. <laughs> so, all right, so the first question about the back of sidewalk trees in, this, in the sidewalks, um, it depends how close you plant to the sidewalk because the tree just has girth. It's going to be growing. If you plant it in the right location, you plant the right tree, the root system, you see in this business, you want to, you're not thinking about the tree as you're planting it today. You're thinking about what that tree is going to look like in 20 years. So you kind of have an idea. You already know this tree is going to get to 25 feet. You know that the canopy structure of this tree looks a certain way well, now you look at all the conflicts within the ground area you're going to be planting, you kind of get an idea of how that root system is going to eventually look. Now, granted, it's underground. It could go under the pipe and around the pipe, over the brick wall, whatever. But you try to like put it in the right place that it's not going to cause a problem for the sidewalk. So back it up a little bit. Um, evergreens and electrical wires. Uh, well, first of all, we're not planting large shade trees under the electrical wires anymore. When we, re when we remove a large shade tree from money, the electrical wires, we're replacing it with shorter growing trees that won't come into conflict with those electrical wires in the future. Um, it's just, it's just the right thing to do. It just makes more sense. Um, as far as evergreens go, evergreens really won't make a great street tree. They don't tolerate salt very well. And they also want to be growing down towards the ground. So if you think about that, we wouldn't have a sidewalk. We'd have, um, you know, conflicts within the street. Um, so we have been getting into planting uh, evergreens in some of our park landscapes, uh, trying to put the right tree in the right place again. 
Uh, we've been planting some different types of fir. We've been planting some uh, blue spruce, um, some different trees. We're actually going with, they're not necessarily evergreens, but some deciduous uh, needle trees in uh, Don Sequoias and bald cypress. We're planting those in certain locations where we feel like they can do a really good job and, and withstand some of the winters here. Um, so we are, we are in the evergreen business, just not as a street tree, not as a downtown tree. They're just, they're, they're too shallow rooted and they just want to be too broad at the base. It would cause more problems than they're worth. Before we sign off for the night, I do want to plug the Quincy Tree Alliance. Again, we are, you know, we are a membership organization. We love new folks coming in. So if you care about trees, if you want to help us get more trees in Quincy, you know, please do join us. You can find us on our website at quincytreealliance.com or on Instagram at, at Quincy Tree Alliance. And we're on Facebook, of course. So please do, please do join us. <laughs>